Okay. Hello, everybody. I see it's uh, we have uh, 28 attendees already. So maybe uh, let's wait for another minute. So for the for everybody to join us. Well, I think in the meantime, I can start with the introduction. So um, good afternoon to everybody. Welcome to our seminar, um, A Fairy Tale, Managing Your Data to be Findable, Accessible, Interoperable, and Reusable. It's uh, part two of our series on open access and open science. Um, as last event, also this event is jointly um, uh, managed by STI and ICTP Library. I'm very happy to introduce to you uh, Professor Elena Giglia from the University of Turin. She is head of the Open Science Unit at the university, but she's also part of um, the International Open Science Network. She's uh, a part of uh, several, uh, in taking part in several working groups, EU funded projects, and also scientific boards. And she has been training and advocating for open access and open science since 2010. So there is uh, lots of experience uh, you will be able to talk about. Thank you for, for that. Um, and I think we can uh, start with the uh, with talk right now. Thank you for coming, Elena. The floor is Thank yours. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Thank you for the introduction. But it also means that I'm really old because, you know, it, it, when you say I've been advocating since 2010, <laughs> it means also that I'm. Yeah, old. just mean, you know, we pick yeah. only the best for us. Yeah, yeah, course. of so course. So thank of you course, for that. Of course. <laughs> So thank you for inviting and thank you for the people who I, I see I see people still joining but anyway so from now on I will go um, I will be switching off my camera just not um, to have yeah okay sorry Ellen to interrupt uh, something I forgot since you know I'm new to the whole thing uh, please for everybody uh, of course after your talk uh, we're going to answer your questions so please. If you have questions during uh, Elena's presentation, please post uh, your questions in the Q&A section. And after the talk, we're going to come back on, and answer these questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eva, for reminding us. So let me check if it works. Can you see the presentation mode? Yes, we can see it. OK, OK. So um, as, as I told you last time, uh, because this, this is our uh, second uh, meeting, uh, last time we saw uh, something about open access, the why, what, and, and how. Uh, today we are going to deal with the FAIR principles. Um, and as I told you last time, the slides are already available on, on Zenodo. Then I, I, I will put the, the link into, into the chat later on. And actually, as, as I told you last time, it's a sort of mission impossible to talk about the fair principles in uh, less than one hour, just to leave some, some time for the, for the questions. But anyway, we will try. And of course, these two meetings are just a sort of appetizer, if we can say, if, if we can put it this way, because there is a lot more to discuss in, in open science. So we should need should need um, much, more, much more time okay, to, to discuss all, all the elements and the components of open science. But uh, coming to FAIR, why do we need FAIR? Because data are difficult to find, and once you found them, maybe they might be difficult to access, and once accessed, they might be difficult to interpret, to understand, and if you don't found them, then you spend a lot of time and money in uh, recreating them. And first, have you ever lost your own data or you could no longer uh, access or understand your own data? So that's why we need FAIR. All, all, the, all the above are the reasons uh, why we need uh, FAIR data. In dealing with data, we have the three steps. Hopefully, all our data should be as open as possible. You know that as open as possible, as close as necessary, is one of the principles behind all the uh, European policies in the last, I would say, 15 years. Um, so hopefully, um, all our data should be open. But if our data are not fair, 
uh, opening might be risky because of a potential misuse or misinterpretation of your data. And if your data are not properly managed from the beginning, from day one, uh, it's almost impossible to make them fair, or I would say it's time consuming, so um, it doesn't work, okay? And you can also uh, see the figure uh, the other way around. So you need to, first you need to manage your data because managing data is in the, in the primary interest of any researcher just to have a workflow which is uh, effective and streamlined, then you have to make them fair. And if possible, you have to open them. But being in the EOSC era, and we will see something about EOSC during the presentation, uh, managed data and fair data are increasingly uh, overlapping, okay? And we are talking about uh, data which must be fair by design, okay? And if you are planning to, to apply to, to get funded in, uh, in Horizon Europe, bear in mind that we have um, responsible management of data according to the FAIR principles as one of the uh, mandatory uh, practices in, uh, in Horizon Europe. So bear it in mind if you are planning to, to apply. What does FAIR mean? Uh, the article was published in Nature in March uh, 2016. To be findable, you need identifiers and metadata. To be accessible, you need to know where to find the data and under what access conditions, and you need open formats. And I say it now, and I will keep saying it um, until the end, accessible does not mean open, does not equate to open. It simply means that I need to know where to find the data. Interoperable means that you have to use standards and ontologies, and reusable means that you need licenses and documentation in order for your data to be reusable. And of course, not only for humans, but also for machines. So metadata, ontologies, standards, and all the above should be uh, machine uh, readable. Uh, before boarding, uh, and just not to be uh, wrong on that, uh, please address um, beside the original uh, paper, also this paper about interpretation and implementation uh, of FAIR principles. The authors are, are the same, but it's important just because we, we said the FAIR are principles, so you need uh, implementation. But if you interpret uh, in a wrong way, the FAIR principles uh, and the implementation also will be somehow uh, wrong. And if you want to know what FAIR means uh, on a, in the daily life, uh, please watch this short video. It's just four minutes. And um, as usual, you have all the, all the links uh, in the slides uh, just to see how FAIR works. Okay, and it's a sort of train. Okay, it's a fair train calling uh, just at the station. Uh, the train recognizes useful um, according to the metadata. So, metadata are really crucial uh, in a fair world. The focus is on reuse. So, it's on the R uh, of the acronym FAIR. And why is that? Because uh, data are not used. Um, are not used after they, they were created uh, in 80%, 85% uh, of the cases. And that's why the European Commission is uh, funding this uh, European uh, Open Science Cloud. Uh, this quote is uh, from the President Ursula von der Leyen last year in, uh, in Davos. And that's why we have the EOS. This was the, the day the EOS was launched uh, exactly three years ago in, uh, in Vienna on this day. And what is, it, what, what is this European Open Science Cloud? It is a seamless access uh, to open by default FAIR data, okay? So it's a sort of a virtual environment in which uh, data producers, service producers, and innovators and simple citizens meet, and uh, basically they, uh, they innovate, okay? And they, they can translate research into benefit for society uh, at large. Uh, you don't have to think 
about EOSC as in, in let's say, in computer uh, science, um, in a computer science meaning. So EOSC is not a big box, uh, is not a cloud. You, you don't upload anything uh, into EOSC. You simply make your data fair so that the EOSC services can find them. The, this idea of the train calling at fair station uh, is precisely what, what EOSC is. Uh, just to give access, seamless access to more than 20 million uh, European researchers. And as you can see here, um, the European Open Science Cloud is a supporting environment for open science and not an open cloud for science. And if you look at the EOSC uh, Strategic Research and Innovation Agenda, you will see that the first objective of the EOSC is to make open science the new normal. Okay, so. It's, it's, um, it's a cloud, it's, it's an environment to support open science and not, not the reverse. Um, these are the FAIR principles. So they are, as you can see here, they are very, very technical. So like data are assigned a globally unique and eternally persistent identifier, uh, data are described with rich metadata. And in dealing with accessible, I, uh, I would stress it and keep stressing it, accessible does not mean open. Uh, data can be closed, uh, but if I'm a researcher uh, interested in this kind of data, I need to know where to find them and under what uh, access uh, condition. Uh, there will be an increasing overlapping uh, among fair and open. As, as we saw that in the, at least in the uh, European framework, um, the principle is as open as possible, as close as necessary, but there will always, always be uh, perfectly fair uh, closed data. And not just for, let's say, privacy or personal data or sensitive data, but one, one example I, I got in, in giving a seminar to biologists, um, we were talking about citizen science and people recording with their um, smartphone uh, the migration of, of uh, birds in the sky. And I asked, well, why uh, can't, you, can't you put this kind of data open? And they, they laughed and told me, and what about hunters? Okay, so for any reason, you you have to you can keep your data closed, and they are um, provided that they are perfectly fair. Okay, so if I'm a researcher interested in uh, bird migration, I need to know where to find the data, even though the data are not open. Okay, so we said that fair uh, refer to a set of principles, so it's not a standard. Okay. Uh, it's not equal to RDF, linked data, or the semantic web. It's not equal to open. We have already said and uh, repeated it. And it's not just about humans. Uh, I would say the contrary. So it's mostly about, um, about machines. If you want to know what FAIR uh, is in a nutshell, please, uh, please address this uh, infographic which is not something, you know, uh, it's not just uh, colored and bright and so on. If you click on the icon on, for instance, on persistent identifier, then uh, there will be the corresponding page on the Australian uh, Data Commons service uh, explaining what uh, persistent identifier is, uh, the tools, the training, and anything about the single um, uh, FAIR uh, principle. Uh, there are also fair principles for software, as you can see, some were just rephrased, some were uh, discarded, or some is newly proposed. But anyway, we uh, can also um, talk about fairness in, uh, for software. And uh, this is uh, one of the, I would say, this is the model of the fair object, digital object of the future. Uh, coming from this report issued the same day in Vienna in which the EOS was launched. Uh, so you see several layer. Uh, at the core, we have the digital object. Then we have a layer of identifiers, uh, a layer of standards, and the uh, more external layer of metadata, which is the contextual uh, documentation. Um, 
if you look at the fair principles, you will see that some, uh, the one that you find here in red, this is a, a slide uh, by Eric Schultes from GoFair. He is one of the, the experts with capital E in, uh, in Europe about FAIR. Uh, you will see that some are, let's say, technical, and some are uh, domain specific, um, the, the one in blue, you see, but they are uh, strictly interlinked. And if you want to know more about this uh, difference, when you when you deal with fair data um, principles, uh, which is the your responsibility as a researcher, and which are the elements a good repository uh, is taking care of. Uh, in dealing with there uh, with fair, you should set because fair is something we said it's, it's a principle so uh, community should implement um, the fair principles according to the specificity uh, and respecting the specificity of, of the scientific community so it's, it's bottom up okay and you should set this uh, so-called fair implementation profile um, which then can be used by the community and the idea behind the fair implementation profile is convergence. So um, in the past, nobody told us to use, for instance, the TCP IP protocol for the internet, but we all use it because it works, okay? Uh, it's easy, it, it, it works, uh, it's scalable, it, it's whatever. So this idea of converging on the most useful solution for a specific uh, community. And basically, this is a fair implementation profile. As you can see, the community should say which identifier um, they are using, which metadata schema, which ontology, and so on, as we will see uh, later. But to create a fair implementation profile or simply to, to deal with fair data, um, we all need uh, this new profile, which is the data steward. Um, data stewards are uh, one of the critical uh, success factors in, uh, in the EOSC uh, and any research performing organization uh, should set its own uh, data stewards uh, network because they support researchers in verifying uh, their data. And it, it's a very high profile uh, new profession uh, because the data steward should have um, as a core competence, the competence on data, on domain data, okay? And then on top of that, uh, he or she uh, gets also transverse, transversal competencies on, uh, on FAIR. But the, so I, I should say that the perfect profile for a data steward is a PhD. Okay, so with a strong uh, competence on, on domain data. If you want to assess if your data are fair or not, or better, the grade uh, of fairness of your data, we are going to see uh, four different uh, tools. The first one is the uh, fair self-assessment tool, which is really useful and helpful as a, I would say, as a first step. OK, just to ask you the right questions about your data. Does the data set have uh, any identifier uh, assigned? But of course, it's just for humans. So uh, you can answer yes. But then if the machine uh, goes and does not find any identifier, your answer is not so, let's say, uh, useful. Anyway, so it's helpful. Just the first step, just to think about uh, how fair uh, your data uh, could be. The second one is fair aware. Uh, again, it's just for humans. So it's you as a researcher uh, answering the questions. But you see that if you click on the I or if you uh, reply no, um, this short, um, let's say, uh, information, information card uh, will pop up uh, explaining what a, um, a persistent identifier is. And if you want to know more, you can access more information, but it's, it's very basic, very uh, target oriented. Then we have uh, machine readable tools in order to assess the fairness of your data sets. 
So you simply here, you simply put your DOI, the DOI of your data set, and the fair maturity um, evaluator will check about the fairness. And if it fails, it also gives you back the reason why uh, the check uh, failed and what you have to address in order to make your data fair. Another one is the Fuji. Again, is in beta, but you simply put your DOI and the system checks. Uh, fair enough, fair enough, not only checks uh, against the fair uh, principles, but it also gives you a sort of bonus, okay? You can see here in the, in the booster uh, icon, meaning that you are fair and you, you have also a bonus, okay? So the system found something more than the simple uh, fair principles, uh, fair principle, sorry, um, uh, compliance. Uh, if you want to make your data fair, you have some tools. I would um, uh, show you at least two. One is the FAIR Cookbook. Uh, the FAIR Cookbook is an ongoing project from a, from a Euro European project based at the University of Cambridge. So it's ongoing, it, it's on the making. So I took a screenshot, but today it could be uh, different because it's um, it's really, it's an ongoing um, project. And I find it really useful because you have single recipes, okay? Uh, for single aspects of, uh, of FAIR, how to make FAIR, for instance, uh, at the metadata, the metadata schema or something like this. So again, very practical, very target oriented and uh, very, uh, let's say, hands-on. The second one is the FAIR, uh, the data stewardship uh, wizard, uh, which is useful also to draft a data management plan, which we will see it's the tool to make your data fair. Uh, it's a wizard, so it creates uh, upon your uh, answers. Uh, if I answer yes, it opens a path. If I answer no, it opens uh, another path. And uh, it gives you external links to potentially useful tools. And it opens also the book uh, data Stewardship for Open Science by uh, Baron Mons, who is the expert with the capital E, not one of the, but the expert on fair data. Uh, and the, the book chapter is here. So what's up, do, don't, and that's it, okay? So again, uh, very, uh, very simple, very uh, practical, very target oriented. And um, basically this wizard uh, guides you in making uh, your data uh, fair. And in the end, you don't have to write anything. So the system automatically will ext extract the relevant information uh, to fill in your uh, data management plan. Okay, So you don't have to write to draft the data management plan, but the system will take the relevant information uh, from the wizard uh, itself. And we will see at the end in dealing with data management plans. So uh, in order to be findable, and please bear in mind that this course on, on FAIR data uh, usually lasts uh, like three hours, okay? So I had to cut, 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 and now I'm, I'm running. But anyway, just to give you a hint of, of what FAIR uh, is, in order to be findable, you need metadata, okay? And metadata can be descriptive, uh, metadata of provenance, technical metadata, rights and access metadata, preservation metadata, citation metadata, whatever, okay? Uh, so you can address this, um, this page uh, on, the, on the Australian data service uh, in order to deal with metadata. If you don't know uh, which are the metadata standards in use in your community, please refer to this RDA metadata directory. I think you are all familiar with RDA, Research Data Alliance. Uh, it's a bottom-up organization. Um, it, it works by uh, interest group and working group and it issue recommendations and standards and whatever. It's really bottom-up, it's community-driven. So if you, uh, if you are interested or if your research is, is data-driven, uh, RDA is a good place uh, to be. And they are um, managing this, this directory, okay? So you, you can uh, look, uh, for instance, in physics 
or in, uh, I don't know, environmental sciences, uh, climatology or whatever, uh, which are the standards in use by the community, because don't forget this idea of uh, convergence, okay? If the community is using a standard and if it, this standard fits our research, please adopt the, the standard, okay? Don't uh, reinvent the wheel or don't uh, recreate it from, from scratch. Uh, one of the, uh, I would say, most useful tools uh, in dealing with metadata is SEDAR. Uh, if you want to uh, have a look to, um, to SEDAR, because SEDAR, uh, it's a system uh, which make it easy, really, uh, to, to collect and, uh, and use metadata. You see, uh, it opens uh, drop-down menus with um, controlled vocabulary, so it, it really uh, makes it easy, okay? It deal with, with metadata. Uh, to be findable, you also need persistent identifiers and um, maybe you can be used to a DOI, a digital object identifier. Uh, what's the, the rationale behind, the, behind assigning a, a digital object, object identifier? That then the research can work uh, by, uh, let's say, uh, bricks, okay? Building blocks. So you don't have, for instance, when you deposit a protocol and you assign a, a DOI to your protocol, then you don't have to rewrite again the protocol anytime you write a paper, you simply recall it by uh, a DOI, by an identifier. Okay? But the same is true as for you as a, as a researcher. So please use the ORCID ID because the ORCID ID is a powerful tool to link you as a researcher with all the other identifiers and uh, services. In order to be accessible and bear in mind that accessible does not mean open, you need somewhere, you need a box, okay? In where uh, to put your data. So you need a repository. Uh, Zenodo uh, is the repository I would recommend because uh, it, it's powered by the CERN in, uh, in Geneva. Uh, it's completely um, free for, for user, for user um, or actually it, it's free until uh, 50 giga per, per record. Uh, you can also create a community, for instance, with the acronym of your project. Uh, you can choose different level of access, closed, embargoed, restricted. Uh, open, uh, whatever. Dataverse is also very good because it, it, you can federate different dataverses, for instance, in different, uh, in different institutes. Uh, you have also commercial enterprises like Dryad or uh, Figshare. And if you are looking for a repository, if you don't know uh, if a repository is in use, a data repository, I mean, in, in your community, please refer to Ray3 Data, which is the registry of research data repositories. And you will find more than 2,000 data uh, repositories. But another way, another, let's say, another place uh, to put your data in is a data journal. Uh, there is a growing number uh, of data journals. Uh, they basically publish only data sets with a short explanation, like one page. Um, and the only section, the only uh, mandatory section is the reuse potential okay, of, your, um, of your data set. But uh, look at this paper. Uh, it's, it's really a way to put data uh, into the scholarly communication system, okay? Because it's a publication, it's a journal, so it counts also for evaluation purposes and so on and so forth. In order to be accessible, you also need open formats, okay? So you have preferred formats, um, uh, and this is mostly for long-term preservation, okay? Because your data hopefully should be reusable for the next 10 or 20 years. So uh, the, the typical example is don't use a Microsoft Excel file, but a CSV, okay? A CSV file or a TXT or a PDF. So the, the format should be uh, understandable and uh, for, for anyone and usable for anyone. Uh, this is one of the recipes of the FAIR cookbook. 
uh, from proprietary to open standard data format. As you can see, you have the difficulty level, the reading time, uh, the recipe time. This is a hands-on if you have executable code inside. So it, it's right, like really like, like, um, like a recipe. In order to be interoperable, you need uh, standards and ontologies. And if you are not familiar, but I'm sure you are familiar with these uh, terms, you can refer to this guide. Um, an, a, an interesting tool to add ontologies uh, to your data set is the um, right field uh, tool to add ontology to your uh, spreadsheet. And um, this is another recipe from the um, uh, fair cookbook we, we saw before. And this is the main tool you should use to be interoperable. This is the fair sharing registry. As you can see, uh, it contains the standards, databases, policies, collections, whatever. And by standards, we can find um, ontologies, metadata schema, um, I don't know, protocols or whatever, okay? So again, if you look here and you find what your community uh, is using in order to make your data fair, please converge uh, to these to these standards. If you don't find it, you can suggest and um, have it included in, uh, in fair sharing. To be reusable, you need documentation. Documentation is basically what you put in the readme file. Uh, it's in your primary interest as, as researchers to properly document your data and your data sets, okay? Because it, 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 Associating the right documentation to your data set, you avoid um, the misuse of your data, but you also keep the integrity of your data because in the documentation, you will also explain all the process, the tools you used, maybe the software, the code you use to process your data, um, whatever, okay? Basically what you put in the readme file. And why not? Have you, are you familiar with OpenLab Notebook? Uh, because I, I think they, they could be the, the future of, uh, of scholarly communication, uh, RStudio or uh, Jupyter. Um, because in, in, in an open lab notebook, you can put everything. So you have the, the descriptive text, text, but you also have the data, you have executable code, you have basically um, anything uh, relating to your, uh, to your experiment, to your research. So my question would be, do you still need uh, journals to publish your research once you can make your open notebook public? But anyway, this is protocols.io, one of the tools uh, we use in open science um, to convey this idea of building blocks of research, okay? So once you deposit your protocol, as I was saying before, then it, it gets a DOI and then you can simply record it. And if you want to address in a, let's say, in a wider, um, with a wider perspective, this idea of uh, a reproducible science, uh, of a fair science, um, there is this, the Turing way, uh, which is again, a bottom-up initiative, uh, a, a book which is uh, co-authored by, by the community, and it deals with fair data, data management plan, uh, reproducible practices, uh, ethical practices, ethical, ethical aspects, uh, whatever. So it's really, uh, I would say, uh, a starting point in making your research uh, fair because we used to uh, talk about fair data, but actually um, every component of the research cycle should be uh, fair. And to be reusable, you need uh, licenses. And this, this specific part of the uh, of the R uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in the acronym FAIR uh, would require uh, a lesson or maybe uh, an entire course uh, because legal aspects in, in managing data are really uh, complex, okay? And there is something I know when I, when I show uh, the, the next uh, figure, uh, something which is like, you know, uh, a bomb when, when, you, when you are in a physical room because you see researchers um, jumping on their seat. 
because raw data are not protected by copyright, okay? Copyright protects only the creativity. So uh, on raw data, like on information, on mathematical formula, there is no copyright uh, because there is no creativity, okay? Uh, if you have a database, but you need to have a database, which is defined in the, um, uh, um, in the um, directive, in the European directive, as a collection of independent works, data or other materials arranged in a systematic or methodical way. So if you have a database, you have the protection of the uh, sui generis um, right, which lasts 20 uh, years and basically protects the substantial efforts in obtaining the data, okay? Then if you have a creative database, you also have the protection of copyright, but what copyright protects in this case is the structure, okay? So it's the creative uh, part, is the selection, uh, the arrangement uh, of the data and never the raw data, the content uh, itself. And I know it's, it's difficult because the researchers tend to uh, think to their data as my data, okay? But you can have uh, other uh, form of legal protection like contracts or agreements or whatever on your data, but not, not the copyright, okay? Uh, if you want to know more uh, about this uh, idea of data protection, there is this wonderful paper by uh, Thomas Margoni, who is a lawyer, who is an expert in copyright law, and uh, Ignacy Labastida. And Thomas also um, published these uh, three guides provided by the Open Air Project. Uh, what is research data? The protection of research data. How do I license my research data? And can I reuse someone else's research data? So these are three uh, very uh, helpful guides in order to deal with legal aspects and legal protection uh, of your data. Then you have this Creative Commons fact sheet on your data explaining why the CC0 license, so the uh, sort what is called the dedication to public domain, is the only um, legally a suitable license for uh, for your data. As we said, th there is no copyright, okay? So even a CC BY uh, could be uh, not legally uh, right, which does not mean that you don't have to cite the source, okay? So you uh, applying a CC0 license to your data uh, does not mean to be academic unpolite, but everything is explained in a very uh, clearly manner in this uh, Creative Commons fact sheet. And just to finish this, this short presentation on FAIR, uh, to make your data FAIR and basically to manage your data, you need a data management plan. A growing number of funding organization is requiring um, a, a data management plan. Uh, what is a data management plan? Uh, is a structured way uh, to think to your research from the perspective of your, of your data. So how do you collect them? How do you preserve them? Uh, how do you describe? So the metadata schema, how uh, do you share them? And if you can't share them, so if you have to keep your data uh, closed, why? So the reasons why you have to keep them closed. Um, it's a powerful tool because if you set clear rules from the beginning, um, all your research process will be will, will run uh, smoothly, okay? And all the more so if you are in a, uh, let's say, in a collaborative uh, research, because then you have clear rules for all uh, the partners. And the data management plan is a living document. Okay, it's a living document, so it needs to be updated anytime the conditions of the research uh, changes. You have basically two uh, tools, you have several tools, but the, the two I, I could recommend, one is DMP online, and the other one is the data uh, stewardship wizard we already uh, saw in the in the previous slides okay and here you have two uh, videos uh, explaining it's it's a they are tutorials okay explaining how um, how they how they work but they are really very let's say 
um, useful tools because they guide you in drafting your uh, your DMP. You also have tips and tricks. Uh, look, for instance, at number seven. So uh, you can't copy uh, a DMP because every research project is unique. And look also at point nine. Uh, if you don't know, say so. Okay. So if you don't know, for instance, uh, the expected size of the data you are going to generate in your project, you simply state it, but maybe at the beginning. So at this stage of the project, we can't estimate the amount, the, the, the size, the volume of the data we are going to generate. And then in the first, um, uh, in the first uh, version, in the first updating um, of the DMP, then you can revise this, this uh, statement, okay? And why it's so important, for instance, to estimate the volume of your data? Because there might be costs, okay, um, to, to preserve uh, your data. As I told you, uh, Zenodo is for free uh, until 50 giga per uh, item per record. Okay. And uh, bear in mind when you deal with your data that the principle is uh, as open as close, as possible, as close as necessary. Okay. And why not? Uh, not only data. Okay. You can make your entire workflow uh, open, as you can see in this um, rainbow created by Bianca Knamer and Jerome Bosman from the University of Utrecht you can open, you have the tools to open up every step of your research. And if you are interested in, of course, we can have uh, another uh, meeting uh, about this, uh, the opening of the entire uh, workflow. And that's it. That was my uh, mission impossible for today, uh, just to leave more time uh, for the, um, uh, for the Q&A uh, section. I, I see something in the chat, but maybe we also have Eva. Do you do we have something in the in the Q and A also? So I'm checking. Thank you, Elena, Elena for your excellent uh, presentation. At the moment, I can't see any questions in the Q and A section. So, dear participants, uh, if you have questions, please post them in the Q and A section or also in the chat if you want to. There is a question about Zenodo, I see here. No, the limit of 50 giga um, is, let's say, um, if, if, you, if you look at the policies and the, and the frequently asked question in Zenodo, uh, they, they, they say, if you have bigger data sets, please contact us. So I think you can, you know, <laughs> you can negotiate about it's not it's not the maximum size of the deposit, okay? Um, it's only that up, if you have uh, bigger data sets, you might you might have to pay, but they they say please contact us, so please contact your colleague at CERN, and they will tell you if there are costs or not. Okay, Nicoletta, wonderful. last yeah, last last week there was some uh, unanswered question, but unfortunately um, uh, we didn't manage to uh, let's say your colleagues were, were didn't manage to send the questions uh, until uh, early this afternoon. So now I have the questions and I will answer in a in a in a file and then the file will be shared with you. Okay. Yes, thank you for that. And there is, I see a question in the Q&A section concerning okay. non-fair data. Uh, if I understand this correctly, do you have an example of a non-fair data? Yeah, I, I would say any data <laughs> a researchers are producing now. <laughs> because, <laughs> yeah, attending, um, I, I don't know, maybe your community is more advanced because, you know, physics are advanced. Uh, Anytime uh, you were the first to share preprints, you were the, the first to have uh, the conversion, so the transformation uh, of, of your um, journals in, in open access journals. Um, so maybe your data 
are already fair, but you, you can go to the fair evaluator or fair enough. You put the DOI of, your, of a data set and you can check because the situation in, in other disciplines is, uh, is not like this. So I would say that uh, most data are not fair. And one, one of the slides I, I've cut uh, was a, a report commissioned by the European Commission for the European Open Science Cloud. And it was uh, uh, estimated that the cost of not having fair data, so the situation in which we are now, uh, amounts to uh, 16 billion per year, okay? Because you don't find data, the industry don't, don't find data, doesn't find data, uh, innovators doesn't find data, or if they find data, um, when they, they open the file, the data are not uh, understandable because maybe they are in a format or they need a specific software uh, to be read. Uh, it was also estimated that the researchers spend 79% uh, of their time in cleaning data, meaning when, when you get data from different sources, then you have to clean them, you have to, let's say, align them, you have to make them uh, usable in the same way because they come from different silos. Uh, so 79% of, of the time is spent in, uh, let's say, uh, in making data uh, usable. And that, that's how the 16 billion per year uh, comes from, okay? So there is a cost of not having fair data, but I, I can't tell you the amount of data which nowadays is, is not fair. I would guess more than, uh, more than half, okay? Seeing workshops or conferences and, and so on. But you, you can check, I, I'll give you the tools. Then there is a question from Professor Barzaghi. I have a question uh, about the difference between fair data and open data. Uh, could data uh, published in an article be fair? Uh, yeah, not only they could, they should. Uh, they should because nowadays, uh, we are in the era of the European Open Science Cloud. And nowadays in Europe, if your data are not fair, they simply do not exist, okay? So they have to be fair. As we, we said during the presentation, uh, the concept is fair by design. So your data must be fair, and if possible, they have to be open. Uh, speaking of journals, journals are increasingly asking you to, uh, to publish the data alongside your paper, okay? For reproducibility reasons, for transparency purposes, whatever. But as I was saying in the, in the first slide, when I, when I pointed out the three steps, okay? If you make your data open, but they are not fair, it's risky because you don't have maybe maybe you don't have a license okay so i don't know what what can i what what i can do with your data uh, there might not be the right documentation so i could misinterpret your data or misuse your data or simply if you use let's say uh, if you reuse a data set okay maybe also a reference data set and you use the version uh, 3.5 of the data set. Then I try to replicate your experiment, but I use the version 4.5 of the data set. Your experiment will result not reproducible, but it was not a mistake. It was simply because I used another version of the, of the same data set, okay? And that's again about documentation. So making your data open does not mean put a spreadsheet uh, online, okay? That's why I was saying you need to manage your data, first step, and this is in the interest of researchers. And manage your data means also uh, use, using a file naming system, a folder structure system, and agreeing 
if, if you are um, in a, let's say, in a collaborative research, all the partners should agree on file naming, folders, uh, structure folder, and so on and so forth. So you, you need to manage your data. Then you have to make them fair because you need a metadata schema, you need standards to make your data understandable by others. You need, for instance, to associate all the tools you use to process your data. If you use a specific software, if you use, you, 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 you wrote a code. So, so you have to make your data fair. And then if possible, you have to make your data open. But if the data are only open, like I put a file online, uh, it's not useful for, for anyone. And it could be also be risky, okay? Not only not useful, but also risky. I don't know, uh, Donatella Barzaghi, if I answered your question. <laughs> then Nicoletta, I have a general question. We have been talking about OAs in changes. It seems that the pandemic accelerated somehow the importance of open science. The UNESCO recommendation is working towards this goal. What's your opinion on how long it will take for open science to become a reality? Oh, Nicoletta, that's a one million question. And um, in my opinion, the, the pandemic not only accelerated the, the shift towards open science, but it also showed that there is no other way, okay? Mm -hmm. So we, we got the <clears throat> vaccines in a few months, only because just, I would say, some weeks or the, the same week, uh, the first virus sequence was sequenced in Wuhan. It was available on, a, on an open database, okay? So it's only by sharing that, the, the, that knowledge and, and science uh, progress. And so last time we, we talked about this UNESCO recommendation, which is really very welcome because it's a very strong recommendation, okay? Uh, they are calling for every um, member state uh, to designate 1% of, um, um, of the internal um, gross product to support open infrastructure, to support data sharing, and I really don't know what else do we need uh, but the pandemic to show that sharing is the only way to progress and that you, you can't uh, hide behind a paywall uh, your results, okay? Because in the, we, we, we didn't have together the, the module on, on open science and on the current scholarly communication system, but in the current scholarly communication system, the average time of publication is from nine to 18 months, okay? So in the, more op in the most optimistic uh, scenario, we would have seen the first papers on COVID-19 at the end of 2020. It's nonsense, okay? It does not make any sense. So that's why during the COVID, during the pandemic, the preprints were the most used um, communication channel in the biomedical field, because the, there is an immediate sharing of results. There is an immediate sharing of, of data. And that's the only way to, to progress. <laughs> so that, that's, a good, that's a good question, but I, I, I unfortunately, I don't, have, I don't have the answer, but we have been talking about open access since uh, 2003. So it's really almost 20 years. And the big publishers are uh, too powerful, I think. Um, but we, we, we keep going, okay? So the, the behaviors of the researchers are changing. As we were saying last time, uh, also research assessment criteria should change in order to accelerate this, this process uh, toward openness. So it's, you know, it's a mix of bottom up and top down. So if the practices of researchers change, like using preprints, sharing data, also the rules uh, will change, but it, it can also be the reverse. So if we change the research assessment criteria, the researchers will follow and it's complex, but I, I think 
bottom up and top down, we can, I, I don't know why. I, I, I would say tomorrow or today, but it's not, up, it's not upon me, you know. Well, thank you, Elena. I have uh, one uh, one other question. In fact, since there are no questions in the in the Q and A um, section, very often at the library uh, we experience that, especially young scientists, approach us and they are a bit afraid of opening up the science. So then they would say, "Ah, if I, you know, make my data fair and open it up, maybe somebody else, you know, sees something in that data that I didn't see." Uh, what would you tell these uh, scientists um, in order to take away that fear? Oh, I would say a lot. <laughs> <laughs> we, we should need an, an, another se session okay, on, on open science. But anyway, um, no, I would say, first of all, when you deposit uh, your data, your data set or your preprint or even your preprint, okay, in a repository, you have a timestamp, okay? So you get a sort of scientific priority. Then if someone else reuse your data, which is all FAIR is about because it's reusable, okay? They cite you. So you, you get credit for, for creating this, this data set, okay? And if you didn't see something in your data set, it's, it's normal, you see, when, when you see your daughter or your son, maybe you don't see something that a third person can, can see in them. Uh, but that, that's the point of fair data, okay? To be reusable, uh, sometimes in unpredictable ways, or even, you know, the Hubble telescope. This is another example I always bring up in, to, to lessons. Uh, there was an exoplanet discovered 10 years after the experiment was, was closed, just because the data were there. So that, that's the point in making your data fair. But be sure that once you deposit, uh, you, get, you get a timestamp, so a scientific priority, you get cited, so you've got visibility and so on and so forth. And then the principle is, again, as open as possible. So for instance, if you want to deposit your data, but then if you want to put an embargo, meaning that for three years, I will exploit my own data, which is not mine, but anyway, I will exploit my, my data and it's perfectly fair. It's perfectly fine. So you can, let's say, reserve the right of using your own data for, let's say one year, two years, and then you open the data set after the debate. So I think you can find a way. You, you don't have to be afraid, okay? Because I, I, I see only benefits in, in being recognized uh, as a person who shared with the community uh, a data set, a protocol, a methodology, a software or whatever to make science progress, okay? That, that would be my answer. Okay, thank you for that. Are there of, any other of course, questions? Of course, it would be easier if, if our funders or if our evaluators would reward a researcher to put the data open. That yes, would absolutely. be a, a yeah. Okay. Absolutely, yes. That would push, okay, researchers to make all the data and the material open. Absolutely, yes. Okay, I don't see any other questions right now. Last chance. <laughs> okay, good. I think then. Oh, I, uh, I forgot to put the link, or do you have the link in, um, in Zenodo? Just to, to be sure that anyone can access the, the slides. Where is it? I think yeah. we had the link. Somebody put it in the chat, but it would be great if you yeah. could share that with us. Oh gosh, where is it? No, it's not here. I was giving you another. Okay, that's that's the right DOI. Where is the chat? Chat, 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 chat. Okay. 
So here we go. Hey, wonderful. Yeah, with the, the slides in the Nodo. I saw that someone also downloaded the, the slides from the first session. So thank you for that. Wonderful. And we've also recorded this session, so we'll put that online so that um, other colleagues um, who could not join today have the, uh, can, uh, can watch it. Yeah. Feel free. And, uh, great. So then, Elena, thank you for coming. Thank you for um, sharing uh, your knowledge on fair data with us. Yeah. And, and I hope to I'm have you here. back and um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, have a seminar soon or a workshop soon that would be really fantastic i think yeah. uh, there is um, you, you've seen also with the last uh, in the last session the many 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 questions uh, being posed so i think there is uh, lots of interest yeah. uh, also at our center yeah uh, and topics. also also if you want um, in your institution if you want to start something about data stewardship i'm available also because you i, I think you need to set this network of data stewards as soon as possible yes do you have a, this would, would be my, but this is a question as a librarian, do you have a, a, a already established a network of data stewards at the University of Torino? No, we are trying to. Okay. Um, but it's difficult because first you have to train data stewards. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And so it's not immediate. That's why I was saying as soon as you can. Uh, so the, the sooner the better. <laughs> okay. And is the library involved in that uh, whole process at your university? No, because as I told you, they need to have um, domain data competencies. Uh -huh. So okay. you, you, yes. need, you need to mm -hmm. have, you, you know, PhDs or something like this. Okay. Yes, with really uh, in physics or yeah. whatever field. Yeah, yeah, yeah because they yes, need to absolutely. know how to deal with, how to manage the data in their field. Okay? Mm -hmm. And as you can see in, in our university, uh, an archaeologist is very different from a medical doctor. Okay, sure. so you you need an archaeologist and a medical doctor to be a data steward in the respective department. Absolutely. For you, it might be easier, but maybe even in physics, you have uh, some mm -hmm. different disciplines. You know, or yes, scientific absolutely. areas with different data. So maybe you might need more than one data steward again. But anyway, it, it's okay. a path you need to go through. <laughs> thank okay. you, and thank you very much Eight. for inviting me. Thank you very much, Elena. Thank you, Elena, and thank, uh, you, thank you to all the participants.